just <laughs> just say my name. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. I think this is number six or seven. Uh, six. Hopefully, it's number six. Um, I know everybody's getting handouts. So welcome to the sixth uh, Legacy of Brown lecture series, ISP 321. I'm happy to introduce, actually, my uh, co the co-teachers are presenting tonight on economic justice issues. I'm happy to present Dr. Michael Mirpol, who will be going first. We're hoping to each talk about 20, 25 minutes and then open it up to questions at the end, right? Not between them. At the end. So hold your questions. If you need to write a question down, please do so. You can write on the handout. Um, and let's go. Thank you. And uh, the class... The, economic, the uh, ISP 321 class is very pleased to welcome Professor Kimura's class, as well as anybody from who is sneaking in here from economics. Uh, the title of this lecture is The Struggle for Economic Justice. And the longer version of the title, and I'm stalling, of course, because I want to make sure that people get the handouts and then um, are able to sit down. Um, we asked the class that was just finished its first half, um, after you struggle for civil rights and you reach a partial set of victories with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, what's next? What is there left to struggle for if you're struggling for justice? One could make the case that, uh, okay, we've dealt with issues of race, let's go on to deal with uh, issues of women's rights, issues of gay rights, issues of immigrant rights. Um, but in fact, that's not what happened. Uh, the man who is most associated with the civil rights movement of the South, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and we always like to do this, we recommend highly, especially for those who are not in our class, that uh, a man who got a um, honorary degree from John Jay, a man named Taylor Branch, wrote a massive three-volume study of the United States between the middle of the 1950s and 1968 called America in the King Years. And the first volume is called Parting the Waters. And in that first volume, it goes up to 1963. In the second volume, it goes up to 1966. And the question was, after the victories in the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, and I now am putting myself on the clock in 20, 22 minutes, uh, I will turn into a pumpkin. Um, what next? And uh, what Dr. King argued, and that's what he did for the rest of his life, is that there is a massive necessity of fighting for economic justice. That it's one thing to say that you can't deny somebody the right to a job or the right to a place in a school, or the right to vote on the basis of the color of his or her own skin. And that's relatively straightforward. You can actually pass laws saying you can't do that anymore. But that doesn't solve the disproportionate impact of the economic system on people of color with higher rates of poverty, higher rates of unemployment. And so the question arises, how do you deal with that? Do you just pass those laws and let nature take its course and it'll solve itself? Dr. King said no, and neither did his followers. And in fact, in 1966, the two men who created, organized the March on Washington, A. Philip Randolph, who had decades earlier organized black sleeping car porters in a very powerful union, and Bayard Rustin, who was an incredible organizer, a man with incredible strengths, um, they presented to a White House conference in 1966 a thing called the Freedom Budget. But let's back up a little bit. In 1949, the United States ratified 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you have before you a piece of paper that begins with the words Article 23. And let's look at the first paragraph in Article 23. Everyone has a right to work. Everyone has a right to work. That means everyone has a right to a job. There's nothing in the United States Constitution that says you have a right to a job. There's no law anywhere in the United States set of laws that says you have a right to a job. You have a right not to be denied access to a job that exists because of the color of your skin or your gender or in some localities your uh, sexual preference. But nowhere does it say that you have a right to a job because if you have a right to a job, just like your right to vote, what does the right to vote mean? It means that the government must let you vote, must provide a place for you to vote, must provide access for you to vote, must make it possible for you to vote. If you have a right to a job, that means somebody has to hire you. And that's where the problem, the economic problem comes in, and the two of us are economists, and this is a lecture on the struggle for economic justice, and so the first question is, do we agree? Do we agree that that paragraph in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is appropriate? Um, it would be nice to do a little bit of a, a, sh a show and tell, a kind of a straw poll here. Uh, everyone has a right to a job. What about putting that up as an amendment to the Constitution of the United States? How many people would vote yes on that? Put your hands up if you'd vote yes. Come on, I'm going to try to do a little count. So do it. I wanna, I wanna, this is a straw poll. Now, you, people will have the right to abstain if you're uncertain. This is not Peter Yarrow last week who said, you got to sing or you, you're asleep. Put them up. Let me count. Please, I apologize. Two, four. I, I don't have to be perfect. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Somebody put their hand down. Twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Okay. How many... Uh, would be opposed to putting that in the Constitution of the United States. Hands up. Hands up. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Okay. How many are abstaining because you're not sure? It's perfectly legitimate to abstain. Hands up again. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen. All right. Sixteen, thirteen to twelve. First of all, that's a nice size for the crowd here. We, we're very pleased about that. Um, but notice that's a very significant split, and there's a reason for that to be a significant split, because there are two versions of economic justice. And one version says we have rights to jobs, uh, keep going. We have rights to a decent pay, that's uh, paragraph three in Article 23. We have the right to a decent standard of living. We have a right to health, to food, to clothing, housing, medical care. We're in the middle of this massive fight because Congress passed a thing called the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, and people in the country are screaming because this is going to destroy the United States by forcing employers to give people Medicare, medical care, by forcing people to, to, to join these insurance exchanges, by forcing everybody to have health insurance or everybody to be given health insurance, by forcing taxpayers to finance people who can't afford it to have health insurance. That's a fight that's going on right now. In 1949, the United States government signed this thing, in effect saying, yeah, as far as we're concerned, everybody has a moral right to health and health care. So this is a lot of stuff that people have a right to, and why do they have that right? Because they're human beings. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, of course we can be cynical. It was signed by countries that practice slavery. It was signed by the, the countries of the Soviet Union who practiced, yeah, if everybody had a right to join a trade union, but the trade union was controlled from the top. It wasn't democratically controlled. Um, so a lot of countries signed it, you know, the joke about I promise you and I cross my fingers, which means the promise doesn't work. Well, that's true, but, you know, within the United States, you know, supposedly we took this thing very seriously, and yet we certainly have never passed a law to move in any of these directions. When we do, we have these monster fights about it. Why do we have this fight? Because there's a very different view of economic justice. And that view of economic justice, we're sorry to say, is the one that is accepted by most people in our profession, most economists. And that is, 
nobody has a right to a job because <coughs> if you say you have a right to a job, you're saying we can force somebody to give you a job <coughs> or we can force somebody to pay the money to the government to hire you. And both of those are really bad things. Yes, it's true, we need a government, we've got to have some cops, we've got to have courts. After all, if we have an economy where people buy and sell from each other, we've got to have the cop to enforce the contract. Think about it for half a second. Suppose I make a deal with you, you're going to sell me something. If I am not certain that the deal we make can actually be enforced, and the only deal I'll make is with somebody I can beat up, Literally, if I can't force the other person to come clean on this contract, why would I make it if there's nobody to help me enforce it? And similarly, if I'm the one who can beat up the other person, why would that other person make the contract with me? Maybe they'll pay me and I won't give them the stuff. Or maybe they'll give me the stuff and I won't pay them and I can beat them up. So there is no way to have free exchange of goods and services in a market economy if you don't have some big thing out there to enforce it, and that big thing is called the government. So even the most extraordinary libertarian believes that you need a government to enforce contracts. But other than that, and you know, have a military to defend against foreign enemies, um, there's really not much a government ought to do. That's the sort of the basic sort of laissez-faire economics view, we call it libertarian, you could sometimes call it conservative, free market economists, you can use whatever term you want to use. You can be negative by calling it you know, conservative or reactionary, you can be positive by calling it freedom, but whatever it is, that's the view. And given that view, it is really totally wrong to say that people have a right to a job, that people have a right to health care, that people have a right to a nutritious diet, they have a right to try to sell what they have in the marketplace to get those things. They have the right to try. They have equal opportunity, but not equal results. To say you have equal results is basically to destroy the freedom of all the people that you're going to force to give you those equal results, whether it's forcing an employer to pay somebody much more money than they want to pay, that's what the minimum wage does, forcing an employer to recognize a trade union by having the government come in and fine them if they don't recognize a trade union, forcing people to pay a lot of taxes so that low-income people have their health care subsidized. All of that, a lot of economists say, does much more harm than good. So the two versions of economic justice. One is people, by virtue of being human, deserve certain basic rights, not just the right to be left alone or the right to vote, but the positive right to food, clothing, shelter, and a job. And that's what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says. And that's what the freedom budget presented by Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph in 1966 took steps towards. And the major thing they focused on was Article I. How can we, and the title of the, by the way, I'm sorry for the digression, the title of the conference at the White House when they presented it was to secure these rights. And they were playing on the Declaration of Inde Independence, right? Because in the Declaration of Independence, we are all born with inalienable rights. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted. So post-civil rights, 1964, we were saying, okay, we're going to end second-class citizens for African Americans. Now we have to secure the rights to really escape from second-class citizenship, and it is not possible if people can't get jobs. And so that was the centerpiece. The centerpiece and the one that Dr. King was fighting for when he turned to the North and he ultimately in 1967 and in 68 before his horrible assassination was fighting to create the National Poor People's Campaign where people from all races, from the economic bottom rungs of the ladder would come to Washington, D.C. and say, we want economic justice. And economic justice involves making the articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a reality. And so they made the proposal. And the proposal was very simple. It was that the 
people be guaranteed a job. And if the private sector did not generate enough jobs at decent wages, then the federal government would be an employer of last resort. What's fascinating about this is it actually was introduced into the Congress of the United States in 1974 by Representative Augustus Hawkins of California. Augustus Hawkins was an African American member of Congress. And the early version of it, which was co-sponsored in the United States Senate by Senator Hubert Humphrey, little bit of history here, it was in 1948 at the Democratic National Convention that Senator Hubert Humphrey, then the mayor of Minneapolis, got up and made a speech insisting that the Democratic Party adopt a civil rights plan. Now we're talking about 1948. 1948, the, the Red Cross was still segregating blood. The armed forces from World War II had just fought a segregated war. Jim Crow was ruling the South. Roosevelt's coalition that governed the United States in the 1930s depended on Southern whites supporting it, which is why most of the New Deal legislation left out African Americans, or even worse, led to their dispossession as sharecroppers because of some of the agricultural programs. So here was the Democratic Party adopting a civil rights plank. And so it's not surprising that the man who did that would co-sponsor the bill with Representative Augustus Hawkins and what did that bill call for? It called for a target rate of only 3% unemployment. This is not what Rustin and Randolph wanted. Rustin and Randolph wanted 0% unemployment. What they wanted and what their counterpart in Great Britain, a man named Beveridge, wanted is the idea that there would be more job vacancies than people out of work so that anybody who was looking for a new job would have the pick of the litter, in effect. <coughs> in Congress of the United States in 1974, that seemed too outrageous. So they asked for a target of 3% unemployment, but what they also said was that the federal government's responsibility was to make sure that anybody who was looking for a job could find one, and here was the kicker. If you demonstrated that you were looking for a job and couldn't find one, you could sue the federal government for triple damages. You can imagine what they did to that law once it actually got into the congressional committees. And I'll just tell you, they took all the teeth out of it, they changed the goal to 4%, and there was no enforcement mechanism. So when it was passed in 1978, it was one of those laws, I always like to say it's a law that says apple pie is good for you. It said it would be nice if we could have 4% unemployment, we ain't doing nothing to have it happen. And why not? because the economists would say this will destroy the economy. If you have such a low level of unemployment, then workers will demand higher wages. As they demand higher wages, there'll be a thing called inflation, which means everybody's prices will rise, and the economy will go to hell in a handbasket. And so it's appropriate to have a goal, but it's not necessarily appropriate to keep us there all the time. And here's a historical example. I know I'm getting close. In World War II, the unemployment rate went down to 2%. But in World War II, they had to put it on price and wage controls and ration things. And unless you're willing to have price and wage controls and rationing, the argument goes, you can't have as low an unemployment rate as Senator Augustus, uh, Representative Augustus Hawkins proposed. You can't do what the Freedom Budget proposed. So there are two issues. One is the in effect, the economic justice issue, where one side says economic justice is making sure that people have the things in the Universal Declaration, and the other is the idea that economic justice is a free market where people are not constrained by the government, forcing them to do things to give people rights that they really oughtn't to have. Now, just to give you a mini sense about which side is right in terms of whether or not the economy will be harmed, I refer you to an op-ed column in today's New York Times, which is the sheet of paper that is uh, listed uh, as written by Paul Krugman, in which he cites an IMF study, the other page of which is the executive summary from it. 
And I just, I will commend it to you. You can read that at your leisure. But the Paul Krugman piece basically says that the idea that by redistributing income so that low, low income people have higher incomes because higher income people pay more taxes. There's one side, which is the majority. Again, Professor Gordon Nemhart and I are outliers in the profession of economics. We have to admit that. We're proud outliers, but we are outliers. The majority view of the profession is to the extent that you increase fairness by redistributing income, you ruin the economy. And so you have to sacrifice. You'll end up with slower growth and lower incomes to share if you redistribute income equally. Look at North Korea, look at Cuba, look at any failed communist experiment. They have a lot of equality and they don't do anything. Their economies are in shambles. Well, leaving aside outliers like North Korea, and Cuba is a special case, we won't talk about Cuba, the countries that have either more or less redistribution of income, we're talking about the Scandinavian countries, other European countries, the United States, the United States at different times in their history, the Paul Krugman column refers to the IMF study, the executive summary of which you have. Guess what? It ain't true. There is actual strong evidence from history, cross-country comparisons, that those countries that redistribute more income to make income inequality less have grown faster. European countries, even in the recent negative experience which Europe has had, the countries that redistribute more of their income have had less of a problem than countries who redistribute less of their income. So the old idea, the old fashioned idea that if we spend money to actually make this a reality, it will ruin the economy, the evidence is the exact opposite. And that's what Krugman said this morning in the New York Times. That's what the IMF, which is hardly, I might tell you, a, a sort of a, a a hotbed of socialist uh, uh, ideology, the IMF studies, they produce the exact opposite results. So guess what? If the United States had adopted the freedom budget instead of going in the other direction, especially since 1980, we would probably all be richer today. We'd have more jobs, the GDP would be higher, and the standard of living across the board would be higher. The argument that we have to give up our search for fairness in order to grow faster is garbage. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, who co-teaches the course with me, shares the dubious honor of being in the economics profession, and is an expert on what she's about to talk to you about. You're gonna get cutting edge information. My pleasure. Thanks, and thank you. I really didn't want to have to speak after Dr. Mirapol because he's, um, what should I say? He moves around more than I do. <laughs> so he's engaging where I forgot my water, so I'm going to go get that. So, yeah, I didn't really want to have to follow his act. And then, you know, two weeks ago, my dad was here and my mom, and it's like, oh, God. But anyway. Here we are, and the reason why he said cutting edge research is because I actually have a book about to come out. Um, and today, I'm actually the feature article in Color Lines. I don't know if any of you have heard of the magazine Color Lines. It's actually now an online magazine, but it used to be a print magazine from the Institute for Race Studies, I think, Advancement in Race in um, Oakland. Anyway, I'm now online as their feature article today because I have a book coming out on the history of African-American cooperatives. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you about another way to look at economic um, justice. Um, not just to look at what activist governments can do macroeconomically, but to also look microeconomically, that means uh, local, local economic development, what people can do for themselves in terms of joint democratic ownership. I think I need to move my table over a little bit then I should be ready. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a slide up here about the long civil rights movement. 
One of the ways I've been looking at our understanding of grassroots economic organizing and grassroots ep economic justice is to understand the roles that movements for economic equality and economic independence, particularly among African Americans, has developed. And one of the things I actually noticed is that along with what I'm calling the long civil rights movement, meaning all the different efforts from when blacks first were forcibly brought to the US soil or to the Americas, um, African Americans have been fighting for economic justice. But we mostly know about their struggles for civil rights. What's the difference? Civil rights are really those political rights right, voting rights, the right to live in a same neighborhood with someone, the right to have to, to be integrated, not to have to sit in the back of the bus or use a separate toilet or something like that, right? But economic rights haven't really always been included in civil rights, mostly because even our Constitution, as we just said, doesn't really include anything about economic rights, right? So civil rights were really close to about making sure that our Constitution was applied to all human beings and all citizens, and that all, any human being could be a citizen. But at the same time that most people were fighting for civil rights in the various ways that they did, whether it was 1849, if you were here for my father's talk when he talked about that first su uh, Massachusetts Supreme Court case to integrate the schools in Boston, right? Even though all people were fighting for civil rights for centuries, and we hear about it all the time, especially since the official civil rights movement in the 1960s, we don't hear about all the different other economic activities that people have been doing alongside, and actually often the same leaders. So even A. Philip Randolph, who, yes, he did the freedom budget, but he's really much better known for having been the founder and first president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which is the first black independent union. Um, when he was editor of the Messenger magazine in the 19 teens, he actually was writing about economic rights and cooperative economics, uh, and then went on to be more of a traditional civil rights person. W.E.B. Du Bois, who we've talked about in the past, who's a statesman and known for urban sociology, um, historian, he was also an economist, and he was writing since 1897 about economic justice and use of cooperatives, and I'm gonna explain what cooperatives are in a minute. So throughout all the civil rights movements, we've had this pursuit of economic alternatives because people were understanding that you couldn't, political rights were really not just, were not enough, right? We need something more. Um, but it was actually dangerous to talk about economic rights. What do I mean by dangerous? I guess, oh, it's too late to get the mics for this, right? Anyway, <laughs> um, why was it dangerous to talk about economic rights? Because uh, just like it was dangerous to try to do voting rights, people tried to kill you for registering to vote and stuff like that. People also tried all different kinds of sabotage. Uh, if you tried to own your own company or not use the white store, right? If you pool your resources with your neighbors and open up your own store or share a tractor together, Right? It was dangerous because the white plantation block or the white landowners, if you had that independence, then you wouldn't need them anymore. You wouldn't need to use their stuff or buy their things, or you wouldn't need their land. Um, and then they thought they would lose money. And of course, you know how people get when they think they're going to lose money. So um, that's why, and actually I put it at the end, but that's why I end up calling my new book Collective Courage, because it was actually really took courage in the sight of these kind of dangers, all different sabotages from being killed, beat up, to a bank refusing you a loan um, when people tried to do alternative economics. So as I said, blacks throughout history have tried a variety of strategies, lots of proposals. You saw the Freedom Budget as one of the proposals in the 60s. There have been proposals like uh, black capitalism, buy black, um, all different kinds of things. As I said, Du Bois was an early proponent. He actually proposed economic cooperation. 
uh, as the only effective way that blacks could really gain economic stability and then some economic independence in the face of economic discrimination, that blacks collectively owning their own companies, their own land uh, together, their own homes together, if they couldn't afford to do it by themselves, was really the only way to get out of this economic marginality to uh, avoid economic discrimination, that kind of thing. And he's actually where I started my research because I realized that he was seemed very passionate about this even though most people didn't know this aspect about his life. Um, <coughs> but I want to focus today on cooperative activity from the 1960s since that's sort of where we are in the course. And I went to, I heard um, Andrew Young speak, and does anyone, how, I guess we could do hands, right? I can do hand raising. Raise your hand if you know who Andrew Young is. <laughs> yeah, nobody under 40. <laughs> he actually uh, was ambassador to the UN under Clinton. And before that, he was the first black mayor of Atlanta. He is also part of the civil rights movement. He was uh, worked with Martin Luther King. In fact, I think he was one of his assistants or something. Uh, anyway, he was, at, uh, he was actually honored by a group called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives that I'm a member of and that I work with about five years ago. And um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives actually helps black groups develop cooperatives, and I'll talk a little bit about them more later. But in his talk, thanking people for this award, he actually said that the leaders of the civil rights movement decided not to talk about economics and not to talk about economic rights or economic justice. Why? I have it up there, don't I? <laughs> um, they said that it was easier to focus on the political rights, right? It was clear that we just needed the country to protect and recognize the rights that were already in the Constitution, the rights that were implied in the Declaration of Independence, and apply that to everybody. That was almost a no-brainer, especially by the 1960s, right? But talking about economic rights, economic justice, a job for everybody, um, there wasn't, even in the black community, there wasn't uh, agreement about that. So why would they add a topic that's just going to cause more disagreement, more confusion, right? They wanted to stick with one thing that everybody could agree to. And I was actually shocked that he said that in public because <laughs> I was like, why would he even say that? But he was trying to explain sort of the decision even though all these alternative economic things were actually happening in practice. But this decision not to recognize or talk about those things, but to stick to the things that they thought they could get past, they thought they could get a majority, a massive movement around, and not to sort of muddy the waters. But also remember what I told you, talking about economic alternatives, especially for subaltern populations, subaltern populations mean those who aren't the majority uh, and aren't the dominant, um, it's very dangerous. So they didn't want to get into that. And they knew it was dangerous because even he worked with people in the South who were doing alternative economics and seeing how dangerous it was for them. Um, but publicly and nationally, they had to focus on something that they knew was going to be safer and more um, successful. So <coughs> don't talk about economics, don't talk about economic rights, and never talk about cooperatives. And guess what my whole book is about? African-American cooperatives. <laughs> so why not talk about economics and why not cooperatives? And again, I'm going to explain to you what they are in one second. Um, sorry, not one second. My grandson always says, one second, that's over. OK, now, Grandma, <laughs> let's do it. But sorry, in a minute, I'll get to what is a cooperative. So you don't talk about co-ops, you don't talk about real economic change because, one, by the 60s you're just coming out of the McCarthy era, okay? Anybody raise your hand if you know about the McCarthy era. <sighs> we have a few more young people. <laughs> so uh, Senator McCarthy, Joseph? Joseph McCarthy from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, right. 
uh, anti-communist. Remember, after World War II, the Soviet Union, who had been our ally, uh, becomes our enemy. We're in the middle of a Cold War. We're anti-communism, anti-socialist. Uh, and McCarthy decides that we have to actually purge the Communist Party and purge socialism and communism from the American populace. And so this, the Congress, Senate, actually has hearings um, from people who are accused of being communist. Um, the most famous ones are uh, people in Hollywood, Hollywood producers and actors, but it goes through not just cultural workers, producers, but labor unions also. So basically it's really, if you can't even be a member of the Communist Party anymore, that's all has to be clandestine. Uh, you can't use words about collective, cooperative, everybody, that kind of thing. Um, so especially for black people, right, who are already precarious, as I said, it's already dangerous even before McCarthyism to talk about alternatives, so that, that cinches it. Also, blacks are risk averse, meaning um, there have been lots of times where they've tried to get their foothold in the ma mainstream economy and it's backfired. Either they've tried to do business ownership and it hasn't worked or they put their money in a bank and the bank went under, that kind of thing. So blacks are kind of wary. Uh, so that's the second reason why. And then the third thing is the overall ideology of capitalism. We really as a country, especially because basically in elementary school, right, it's pounded into us, individual initiative, and individual wealth owning, and just we're supposed to all grow up and be Horatio Alger, right? Everybody knows who Horatio Alger, right? No? Okay. Horatio Alger was supposed to be the poor little immigrant guy who pulled himself together, and I guess he started with a grocery store or something, um, and then became a millionaire or whatever. And the idea there is that anybody, all you have to do is try hard, right? Don't be lazy, work hard. In fact, work 24 hours a day, never sleep, basically. Get all your family to work hard, too, and you can become a businessman and then a corporate owner and then a millionaire and everything will be great. So um, we're all taught that. Haven't you all been taught that? Yeah. Now I get into another topic, which is I hate that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, but my students all tell me I have to stop saying that, so... But anyway, that's another Horatio Alger story for a poor black man, right? Remember, he gets rid of his horrible wife. He depends totally on that um, daycare to take care of his child, and then he just does everything he can to get that one position that's open in that marketing place. Sleeps in the subway, takes his poor kid, and sleeps in a bathroom in the subway, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But he makes it. But what about the other 12 people who were competing with him? Didn't they work just as hard? We don't get to see it because it's his story, right? But, you know, and why did he have to get rid of the wife? And he never paid the daycare woman, but we don't, you know, we forget about all that part. But he made it, and all by himself, right? That's the part I really hate, because he didn't do it by himself, <laughs> right? We just saw all the different ways people helped him. So, but that's the ideology. So the ideology gets in the way. We don't want to look at these kind of alternatives, especially alternatives which require people to depend on each other and to work together and to benefit together, which now I can get to is the point of cooperatives. The exceptions, of course, were that we did have the Freedom Budget and there was the National Black Economic Conference in 1969, I think. Um, and even though the National Civil Rights Movement leaders were not talking about economic change and economic alternatives, grassroots practice was doing it. So even though there wasn't a big conversation about it, there wasn't a lot of press coverage about it, in fact, as we said, the leaders were ignoring it. If you actually go to the South, if you actually go to cities in the North where black people were trying to figure out how to do something with a little bit, you actually find lots of examples of people pooling their resources working together and doing economic alternatives, but not getting, not having it in the forefront. So that's what my work has been about. So what is a cooperative? A cooperative is a company owned by the people who use their services. Those who form the company for a particular purpose are the members of the enterprise, which we call member owners. Cooperatives satisfy a need. They're formed. They're businesses that are formed to satisfy a need particularly to provide a quality good or service at an affordable price that the market doesn't adequately provide. So cooperatives are businesses, enterprises that um, operate where markets have failed and they operate where people who don't 
um, have the traditional financial resources to start a business or to do for themselves, pool, come together with other people, pool their resources so together they can do it. They're an internationally recognized uh, corporate structure so that we have an international cooperative alliance uh, headquartered in Geneva and they have an official definition an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, cultural needs through jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprises. That's the other piece that's really important. You have joint stock ownership companies and traditional investment companies, but those are not democratically controlled because your voice, your vote, is depends on how much stock you own in an investment company. So if you own 100 shares of stock, you have 100 votes against the person who owns 10 or one share of stock, right? So the person who puts the most money into an investment corporation, a regular corporation, gets all the say because they have the majority rule. In a cooperative, it doesn't matter how much you invest or how many shares of stock you own, every person has only one vote. So that means everything is decided democratically. Nobody has more control over the company than anybody else. And co-ops actually range from very small scale, three people, to hundreds and thousands of members and multi-million dollar businesses. Um, across the globe, they, we now know that the co-ops employ more than 100 million men and women with more than 80 million individual members. The important part about cooperatives is the democratic participation piece. They jointly owned, you have to work collectively with the other members, you have to make joint decisions, and then that means the surplus or the profits, they don't call them profits, they call it surplus, of the company is shared equally and democratically decided what to do with it. So again, you don't have any one person making all the decisions or running off with the profits. Um, cooperatives also uh, believe in helping other cooperatives. They believe in serving their communities and doing more for their communities. They believe in what's called continuous education because you really can't run a democratic company without people being educated, right? They have to know how to run a business. They have to understand the industry and they have to understand how to work with other people, right? How to make joint decisions effectively, that kind of thing. So you end up learning. You're always learning, developing leadership. Um, learning uh, the books, right? You learn accounting and how to understand a spreadsheet and income statement because again, you have to make the economic decisions too. So everybody has to know that, so you learn math. So the co-op really does so many things in one, right? It allows this economic activity and for you to supply a need through a democratic um, organization, but then in a democratic economic organization, all these other things happen, like you learn things, you become a leader, you then can do other things out in the world at the same time that um, you can share and distribute um, income more fairly. So how have uh, African Americans done this? I have like five minutes left, right? <laughs> Seven, okay. Um, I had one more slide about cooperatives as an economic development tool, so I guess I'll quickly say that and then I'll give you some examples. So they address market failure, um, they pool grassroots resources, they don't just need financial resources, you can use sweat equity, what we call social energy, that's the enthusiasm and uh, desire to be involved and to work with other people. Um, they develop social capital, they use human capital, so um, there's kind, all kinds of ways that at an, a local level um, they keep uh, resources circulating in the community because again being local grassroots um, your co-op isn't about to pick up and go move to Mexico right it's it's built on the members who are there in the community they're more likely not to pollute because again it's all the members are people who live right in that community um, and co-ops can be anything from a housing co-op so jointly owned housing a uh, food co-op or any kind of consumer co-op, grocery store, retail, where the consumers own it so they can say what they want to be sold there. Worker co-ops where the employees own the company, which is the most democratic of the forms. And then producer co-ops where agriculture product producers or craft producers all own a co-op together to help them either sell their product or buy uh, materials jointly or advertise, that kind of thing. 
So not only did I find in my research that African Americans have used this co-op system since the very beginning, since 17, 1800s, um, but there were times of proliferation, especially during times of need. So during the Great Depression, uh, there was a huge proliferation of African American cooperatives and the proliferation of organizations that helped to train and promote cooperatives among African Americans, like the Young Negroes Cooperative League. Um, in the 60s, we have the same similar flurry. Um, even before all the civil rights laws get passed, you have African American groups coming together to run collective farms, to run collective stores, et cetera. So I'll give you a couple of examples in the time that I have left. Uh, so I might zoom through some of these. Anybody from the other class, I can give you the PowerPoint if they're interested, and my class will post the PowerPoint. So Jackson, Mississippi, which has actually been in the news lately because they just had a mayor who wanted to, to bring a co-op economy to the city. Unfortunately, he just died last week. Um, but I think a lot of the people uh, in his administration will be able to keep that going. But Jackson, in 1965, actually had um, people, Poor People's Corporation. In four years, they were running 13 producer co-ops, a marketing co-op, a producing sewing, oh sorry, and producing sewing, leather, woodcrafts, candles. They had over 800 members, many of them who were former sharecroppers. So again, this was a way to pool your resources and do all these things that would help you both um, to own land or to run a business or to get the services and goods that you needed. Uh, and SNCC means the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was one of the civil rights organizations. Southwest Alabama Farmers, uh, again, 64 and 65. They actually came out of a black voter registration drive, the famous March to Freedom from Selma to Montgomery. Um, some of the same people who organized that march also realized that having voting rights wasn't enough. They really needed to do something economically. So uh, they pulled together families, eventually 1,800 families, uh, to do uh, agriculture together. So some of them would uh, be collectively working on farms, and some of them, again, were pooling uh, resources to buy the farm equipment that they needed together to share um, supplies, that kind of thing, at a cheaper price, et cetera. Um, the side note on that was originally eight of the families were white, but they were so harassed by the politicians and businessmen, and banks actually refused to deal with the co-op until the whites withdrew, um, because people, again, weren't even ready to admit to uh, integrated economic justice. So it's a sort of sad sideline. Um, on the other hand, the black groups were able to accomplish a lot, and that co-ops co lasted, I think, for about 10 years. Uh, two more, just quick. John Lewis, who you all should know, is a congressman from Georgia, was president of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, at the time of the March on Washington. In fact, he's the last living member of the podium from the March on Washington. Uh, he was also the one who made the most radical speech at the March on Washington, though they tried to stop him. He also started out his career after college organizing cooperatives in the South. Um, his job, he says in his uh, autobiography, was to help create credit unions, which are a financial cooperative, cooperatives and community development groups, um, helping people to obtain food, shelter, and jobs through co-ops. And he said when he was working, this would be in the early 60s, that the, co the civil rights movement was actually old news. He said the press coverage was actually moving to the north to cover the Black Panthers and the Vietnam War. People were getting voting rights, or sorry, I guess this would have been the middle 60s. Um, but they didn't have enough to eat. So they used cooperatives to actually help them to get enough economic independence so they could eat. And I'll end with a John Lewis quote. My job was about helping these people join together, helping them help one another to fill those needs. Remember the not having enough food to eat. It was about showing people how to pool what money they had to form a bank of their own, a credit union, or how to band together to buy groceries or feed or seed in bulk. 
amounts at low prices, basically how to form cooperatives. So again, that connection, people in the civil rights movement, but quietly in practice were also doing co-op development and alternative economics because getting voting rights really wasn't enough. In fact, Fannie Lou Hamer, another famous voting rights activist, turned to co-ops after she did her voting rights work because she said, we can't just argue for our political rights because they have us, um, they have our hands tied economically, right? If we try to vote, right, they, they throw us off the land that we're sharecropping on, they, they make us, they take us out of our jobs, but if we own our own land and produce our own food, then we can fight for our political rights and don't have to be at beholden to the white people for our economic livelihood. So she also started Freedom Farm and pig banking in order to, again, get people ownership of land, food in their hands, and an economic stability, some co-op housing, so that then they could fight from a position of stability and safety, owning their own economics, then they could fight for their political rights. I just put Fannie Lou Hamer's quote up there, just thought. Okay, you could actually ask either one of us questions, even though Hello. Dr. Mirapol is running with the mic. Yes, so put your, hand, put your hand up, please, and I'll give you the mic. You gotta have questions, come on. I know we didn't say anything controversial, right? We didn't say anything you didn't already know, right? So you know everything, there's no questions, nothing controversial, nothing to spark your interest here. We covered everything, right? Okay, good, you see, we get one question. One makes two, makes three. Uh, mm, I have a question on uh, co-ops. Uh, since they all own it and it's one income, how is it taxed as a company or do they still pay individual taxes or how does that go? It's a great question. There's actually a separate tax law for co-ops. Basically, what t the separate tax law allows is that co-ops have a hybrid accounting system. They um, distribute uh, pay, uh, you know, regular expenses and stuff as a regular corporation and pay taxes as a corporation. And then the surplus, which we would normally call um, profits, is held in separate a separate account. It's considered retained earnings and... Um, uh, uh, patronage, and it's held uh, for the members, and then the members uh, are taxed on what gets distributed to them when it gets distributed. So if if the company decide if the co-op decides to hold thirty percent for the company and then to distribute sixty percent, that individ we each individual member's share of the sixty percent that gets distributed to them at the end of the year, that's what they get taxed on, but the company doesn't get double taxed. So the company only gets taxed on the expenses part, and then um, the shared earnings get taxed as, as it's given back out to the members when it happens. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm not a tax lawyer, but that's the gist of it. But there is a separate tax loss so that it handles those issues. Anybody? Who's next? Yes, here we go. Thank you. See, nobody wants to talk economics. That was my main point. <laughs> um, you mentioned before that there was evidence that proved that if you know, um, economic justice was applied into the Constitution, that it would work for everybody. What kind of evidence were you talking, referring to? The evidence is actually from history. What, what the IMF did is they looked at cross-country comparisons. But Paul Krugman himself has done this in a book called The Conscience of a Liberal. And he basically looked at different periods in American history. And from World War II to the present, we've had two different periods. Basically, we had one period where there was very low unemployment, where tax rates on high-income people were quite high. And uh, the share of income that went to the very richest people in the United States was, I mean, it was still very good, but it was like 8%. The top 1% got 8% of all income. That's still very good. 
they didn't, it wasn't equally distributed. But that was the lowest share that they had had for the entire 20th century. And then since 1980, inequality has risen so that the top 1%, I'm doing this from memory, so I'm not 100% sure. I think it's close to 20% of uh, all income accrues to the top 1%. To give you another example, since the, re the recession ended, the recession of 2008 and 2009 was a terrible blow. Incomes fell all over the place. Since so-called recovery, since 2009, that means we're four and a half years later, 93% of all the increase in income since then has gone to the top 1% of the population. That's the kind of increase in inequality that's occurred. The United States grew much faster between World War II and 1980 than it's gr grown since 1980. So that's the example from the United States. But the IMF study is cross-country, you know. Sweden and Norway and Denmark do a lot better than Spain and Italy and Portugal. In Spain and Italy and Portugal, there's much more inequality than in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. The tax rates in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark are, by American standards, astronomical. You know, like 50% gets redistributed in taxes to give people free education, free daycare, free medical care, subsidies if they have no jobs, etc. So that's the evidence. It's the IMF study, which you have the executive summary of the IMF study, but if you can go online and click and you can have the whole study in front of you. And all Krugman did today is he referred to the IMF study as evidence for that conclusion that I then asserted. I don't know if you want to add anything to that in terms of the evidence. No, you did a good job. Thank you. Next. That was a great question. We, we like questions like that. What about the issue? Look, you all voted. Half of you Oh, no, the question's much better. Here we go. Go. Um, about the political rights lead to some economic um, balance or imbalance. Um, Put the mic closer to your mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> it says that a lot of people focus on the political rights rather than the, econo the economy itself. But don't you think that being focused on your political rights lead to a better economy? For instance, when we vote for uh, politicians that we think um, provides in a way more effort to certain community, for instance, like I will vote for somebody that it's towards the Latino community and how it would benefit us. So, um, that's also a great question, and um, probably going to say something people aren't going to like. <laughs> so ideally, yes, we would think that having the vote, being able to vote, and voting for candidates we think are good would also benefit the economy. Unfortunately, I would argue that that rarely happens for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we vote, we actually are not necessarily picking the candidates, right? The candidates are picking us. Most of the time, the candidates that we even can vote among are people who already have enough money to run or who are being backed by the big money people to run. Um, so we're not really picking the candidates, even though we feel like we are. Second of all, often the candidates are, um, again, being either backed by big money or afraid to make any real change. And I'll give you some examples with black politicians, right? our beloved Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but Barack Obama, if you look at all the people that he appointed, to, especially to all the economic positions, he basically appointed all the same people who got us into the troubles that we're in. Um, he pointed, appointed people who are beholden to the Wall Street and the corporations. They have no interest in changing the economy, and in fact, technically, you know, uh, Obama probably made a backroom deal saying he wouldn't, you know, mess with the economy just so people wouldn't get too upset. Uh, the same thing happened actually with our beloved Nelson Mandela. He got into power, you know, got changes in his government for political rights, but what are they struggling with now in South Africa? There's a huge, huge, huge number of black poverty, black unemployment, because Mandela didn't actually make the economic changes. He got the political changes in there, he got cosmetic, symbolic changes, which are really important, but he didn't go the next step, because if he went the next step, he would have lost his coalition. 
He would have lost the white backing that he had and the international backing. And so, again, he made an implicit or an explicit deal not to deal with the real underlying economic questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> that has to be said. So that's the other reason why I say politics isn't enough. Getting the political rights just are not enough. We're still, as a country, as a world, we're afraid to make the economic decisions that would really make life change for the majority of the people. And I don't know if my colleague wants to say more. Well, the only thing I would say is that uh, part of the reason for that is that we have uh, an economics profession that tries to tell the rest of us that any effort to do what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights demands, what seems logical, yes, of course everybody should have a job. Yes, of course everybody should have enough to eat. Yes, of course everybody should have free health care. But they tell us, no, you just don't understand you're really trying to repeal the laws of nature. And if you do try to create rules that will actually make this happen, you will make the economy worse. And then they give you examples of failed examples that they use. Soviet Union, Cuba, North Korea, they trot them out all the time. And then they accuse anybody who um, wants to do that of being like Stalin or like Fidel Castro uh, or like Kim Il-sung who, if you don't know, was the founder of uh, North Korea. And uh, that's enough. The argument's over. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be, but it is. And that's one of the reasons why I like co-ops, because they're kind of a compromise. Even some capitalists like them, because they see them as private enterprise. <laughs> um, but they're a, a way to really, at least even sometimes under the radar, and in small steps that can grow to bigger steps, they're a way to actually do the things that economists say can't be done, right? So they're a way to actually have people jointly own things that are successful businesses that actually produce the kinds of goods and services that people need and that still can make a surplus and that the surplus can be decided upon by people who equally care about their neighbor and their, their co-worker. And um, so they actually defy all the things that the co general economists say that can't be done. And so even though they're small scale in some ways, uh, as, you see f as you saw from the um, International Cooperative Alliance statistics, they're actually all over the world. People use them and some of them are actually huge companies at this point. So they're not necessarily, they don't have to be small scale except that that's what usually we allow to happen. So. That was one of the reasons I even got into co-ops, because I was trying to figure out how do you get around all the naysayers and all the economic, um, whatever it's called, monopoly of thought <laughs> that won't let you do certain things. More. Come on, people. We're your professors. Hey, That's right. We, our job Gotta is give us a good showing. We're going to be on the website and everything. <laughs> are, um, are there any, like, pension plans or anything like that that allow for long-term uh, like income after they, they finish working? Um, for I'm going to answer that a little differently. There are economic business structures that create better pensions. So <coughs> what's called ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plans. Um, our companies can sell a huge amount or all of their stock to their employees. So their employees, it's not exactly a co-op because it's not necessarily the democratic part of a co-op, but the employees at least own the stock or own a share of the stock, a, a portion of the stock. And what they've been finding when they study ESOPs is that because their employees own the stock and basically the stock ownership is, you get it, at retirement, right? So once you retire, so it's basically a, a retirement plan. It gives you ownership of, this, of the company. When you retire, you can divest from it or keep it going while you need it for retirement. And most of the studies have shown that the ESOPs have much better retirement plans and programs for their employees than regular corporations. So in that sense, that's a way to do that kind of joint democratic ownership or joint ownership in a way that's going to benefit. It's going to be a long term, assuming that the company stays solvent, which usually they do. Um, that gives you an, uh, an investment option. The Canadians, especially in Quebec, they, um, a lot of their union pension plans are actually put into community development 
finance programs, and they've been finding good success with that because there's always need for community development, and so there's always activity and a return, and so that helps their community, but also it gives them a safe investment. They're not really doing a lot of speculation, but they're supporting their community development, and so again, those pension funds seem to do well, um, seem to last long, and they don't, you know, they're not sort of raided or um, so th I don't know if that actually answers your question, but that's the only thing I can think of. Um, I don't know if you were thinking of other government programs that would protect pensions better, or if you really were thinking of companies that give good pensions. Um, so do, do you think that um, we're, we're naturally like ambitious or that like ambition is instilled in us because um I think that's something that would like uh, prevent uh, like co co uh, like a lot of people going into this type of thing into like cor corporate corporatives and and uh, a lot of people agreeing with uh, the, um, the article 43 just because um, I I'm pretty ambitious and I, I don't like to be normal I always like to do better and being the top, and I guess I'm competitive. So do you think that's instilled on us, or are we naturally ambitious? <laughs> that's a great question. It's like whether are we naturally greedy or not, right? And I actually don't believe we're naturally greedy. I do believe that we're naturally ambitious, but I think you're saying we're too ambitious to work in groups or to work well in a collective, and that's where I would part with you. So I do think we're ambitious. I even think we're naturally entrepreneurs, right? When I think of all the different things that people do formally and informally to feed their families and to make a living. To me, that's entrepreneurship, whether we call it, whether we only say entrepreneurship is about you creating this Horatial Alger business that then goes on to be a multi-billion dollar company, right? Um, but I think we're all ambitious and we're all entrepreneurial and if we can be entrepreneurial together, I don't think that should stop us. In fact, some of the most ambitious people I know also have such a strong sense of community that that's where they put all their uh, entrepreneurial and energy into, which is working with others and making whatever it is they do with other people work. Um, if you mean that you wouldn't wanna, you wanna make enough money and not have to share it with other people, I actually think that that's a really short-sighted way to look at things. Because I also get really mad when we talk about, say, a, a Gates, what's his name, Bill Gates, right, as being this fabulous entrepreneur who deserves all his billions of dollars because of how hard he worked and what a great idea he had. Well, <sighs> let's go back and think about all the different things that inputted into Gates' wealth, right? First of all, he had a top-rate public education. Well, where did the public education come from? That's public money from all of our taxes, right? Second of all, he had a wife who helped him raise his children, right? She, in fact, put a lot more time in the kids than he did, so he had enough time to go and do his dreaming and do whatever. All his employees are top-notch employees because they had a public education. The internet and computers, where did those come from? The US military basically built the internet system, and it was military contracts that did most of the money for the initial development of computers. So Gates benefited from all that stuff, which is all public money, right? So why do we think now that he deserves to keep all those billions of dollars that he made when he couldn't have made them without all this public infrastructure that supported him and all the different things that other people in his life did for him, right? Technically, he did it all as a collective anyway, so why shouldn't we recognize and, and have all those people that helped him have a say in it, and why shouldn't he p actually pay taxes commiserate to all the public supports he got? Anyway, in you get addition, the idea. In addition, <laughs> he patented a lot of his software, which is a government-created monopoly. If the government did not enforce his patent, he right. wouldn't make any of that money because anybody could have copied it the minute they saw it. And he spends a lot of money making sure that his patents are protected, and he's been using that power to make Microsoft a monopoly. In fact, at one point, the government was able to prove that Microsoft was using unfair competition, but they didn't give, he didn't give the money back. He kept it. Right, so anyway, so I love ambition. I think I'm very ambitious too, but I think we can be ambitious and be collective 
I think actually that things work best when we're that way. I think most societies have been built on that notion of the commons and collective work and responsibility, doing things together. And I think we can actually all be probably millionaires even and be cooperative and collective um, because, you know, we should be able to think about all the people who have multi-billion dollars that they don't need or shouldn't have. Um, if they shared that all with their workers and stuff, everybody would still have enough money and more um, to do whatever they wanted to with. So I'm not sure we have to feel like being collective and sharing means we have to have less. Uh, can, can I give an example? It may sound like a weird example, and that's Major League Baseball. Up until free agency in the 1980s, Major League Baseball players were subject to involuntary servitude. It was called the Reserve Clause. If you didn't sign a contract with your employer, you couldn't play baseball. And so superstars could make some money, but they couldn't make a lot of money. Then all of a sudden, free agency comes in, and now baseball players can get millions of dollars from their millionaire owners. The billions that is generated by Major League Baseball is now shared much more equitably among all the employees because the employees have a very strong union whose members have never crossed a picket line, by the way, and they won the only strike that they did in 1994. So that's an example of something that can happen with multi-million dollar industry that really shares things with their workers. Yeah, uh, and the Green Bay Packers is actually municipally owned. It's owned by the whole town of Green Bay and, sh and shared equally. And they'll never move they'll because never of move. that. All right, let me one more question because people look like they're starting to leave. One more question, or maybe not. One more question. Oh, good, we got a question. Thank you. So um, you're saying that the majority of e economists are completely against redistribution. Now, I understand that in the near future, uh, Switzerland's going to be experimenting with a universal income. If that's the case, and that and the country doesn't fall apart, where where does their argument go? Yeah, it would be. I mean, it'll be great. It's just like the evidence that the IMF, which is one of the most conservative groups of all, you know, they're finding that it's actually not true the things they said. I actually started out my career um, studying capital controls, and it was the same thing. Most economists said when capital controls, sorry, when a country. Um, puts limits on either how much capital you can take out of the country or how much private investment can come in that's not owned by uh, citizens of the country. Um, and all the uh, common knowledge and all the economists, including the IMF, said it was horrible, that you couldn't make it work, that countries would never grow or whatever. But I studied South Korea, which did incredible things because they had capital controls and weren't at the beholden of international capital. Um, so there are examples that show that these things don't have to work the way they say, and we just have to keep making sure we produce more economists who will challenge them and that we get better uh, publicity about what works and what doesn't work. And on that note, we thank you all for attending, and we will be putting this on the web.